Hi, everyone. Good morning. On behalf of the Pembina Institute, I'd like to welcome you to part one of our webinar series on the future of hydrogen and renewable natural gas in Canada. I'm Linda Cody. I'm the executive director of the Pembina Institute. And to start with, I'd like to acknowledge that we're hosting today's event from the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations in British Columbia. And we are grateful for their stewardship of these lands and waters. If you're meeting the Pembina Institute for the first time today, we are one of Canada's leading independent climate and energy think tanks, uh, known for working with governments, industries, communities, and other groups to advance a prosperous and clean uh, transition to net zero for Canada. Hydrogen and renewable gas, or RNG, are increasingly being discussed, as you know, and that's why you're here today, as promising pathways to this net zero future. And in particular, their application in sectors that are going to be hard to decarbonize is drawing a lot of attention. Um, as this momentum grows, common understanding is, of course, vital to realizing the potential of both hydrogen and RNG and their adoption in Canada. At Pembina, we're really keen to move these important conversations forward. Uh, this summer, we published a primer on hydrogen. And meanwhile, our, as you'll hear from our speakers, RNG offers an exciting alternative to conventional natural gas and also an example of the circular economy in action. So on behalf of Pembina, I'd like to thank the Canadian Gas Association for supporting this webinar series. And we're also very grateful to our donors in British Columbia, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, the Sitka Foundation, and the North Family Foundation for their uh, generous support of our work. Without any further ado, I'll introduce Tara Jutt, our Director of Clean Economy Program in BC, who will be today's moderator. Tara. Thank you, Linda. Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, I'm also joined by Hoda Talabian, our senior analyst with the Clean Economy team, and Stephen Hoy, who's producing the series. Both will be assisting uh, with the webinar today. Um, please note that this webinar will be recorded and it will be available on the Pembina Institute web website at pembina.org. And we encourage you to share the recording with your networks if you choose to do so. All participants will be muted during the webinar. Uh, we'll have some time at the end to answer questions. And please use the chat box to type in your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many questions following the presentations. So let's get started. Canada, like many countries, needs to transition away from fossil fuels to more low carbon and renewable energy sources. As we look to the field suite of energy options needed to reach 2030 and 2050 climate goals, RNG and hydrogen have the opportunity to play a role in the energy mix, primarily in hard to decarbonize sectors or areas where electrification isn't an option. Our speakers today will help us understand Canada's current emissions and sources, walk us through the fundamentals of hydrogen and RNG, including production pathways, costs, and the opportunity to develop these gases with the goal of meeting carbon emission targets. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today and uh, <clears throat> help, who will help us gain a better understanding of hydrogen and RNG and how they fit into our energy mix going forward. And first, I'd like to introduce Richard Carlson. Richard is Director of Energy Policy and Energy Exchange at Pollution Probe, Canada's oldest environmental NGO. He has 15 years professional and academic experience analyzing energy policies and politics in Canada, Central Asia, the Middle East, and East Asia. Richard is a member of the Conseil d'Administration, Board of Directors of the Transition Energétique Québec, TEQ, the Quebec government's energy transition agency. He's also a member of the Advisory Committee of the Positive Energy Program at the Richard at the University of Ottawa and a member of the Research Advisory Committee on the Canadian Energy Research Institute. Secondly, I'd like to introduce you to Sabina Russell. Sabina is principal and co-founder of Zen Energy Solutions, a boutique Vancouver-based consulting firm specializing in hydrogen and fuel cells. She has over 23 years experience working in the clean energy sector spanning a range of roles from technology and product development to product management and corporate development. Sabina leads Zen's project management branch with a focus on consortium-based projects, deploying zero emission technologies and infrastructure. Sabina is currently leading Zen's work to develop hydrogen strategy for Canada on, the on the behalf of the Government of Canada and previously led the BC Hydrogen Study in 2019. Prior to joining Zen, Sabina was with Ballard Power Systems for 18 years 
where she held a range of technical and commercial roles, including Director of Product Engineering. And finally, I'd like to introduce Sarah Stadnick. She is the Manager of Business Development and Communications at the Canadian Biogas Association. Sarah is focused on outreach activities that raise awareness of the sector, including highlights, highlighting biogas technologies and developments to its members and broader audiences and business development, and project work to support the growth and implementation of biogas and RNG in Canada. Sarah sees significant potential in bioenergy and waste to resource technologies. And prior to joining the Canadian Biogas Association, she worked on a variety of related projects in private and public sectors in technical research and business development capacities. Welcome to all our speakers. And I think now we'll go directly into our presentations. Richard, will you please start us off? Sure. Let me share my screen here. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be invited to present on this webinar. My name is Richard Carlson, and I'm the Director of Energy Policy at Pollution Probe. As you mentioned, if you don't know about Pollution Probe, uh, Pollution Probe is Canada's oldest environmental NGO, which is 50 years old in 2019. And we, oh, sorry, sorry, not more something came up. And we last year we conducted a study on potential pathways to the future of the natural gas sector. And full disclosure, this study was funded in part by gas distributors across Canada. Sorry, oh, there we go. Okay. And before we begin, I want to highlight the importance of this topic. As you can see, natural gas is a large component of secondary energy consumption and counts for around a third of all secondary energy consumption, and that which is significantly, which is more than electricity, which is only accounts for around a fifth. And not un unexpectedly, natural gas is also a significant source of GHG emissions in line with the share of demand. So clearly to reach our net zero targets, something has to change. It's also important to look where natural gas is used, because unlike almost any other fuel, natural gas is used in almost all areas of the economy. I won't be looking at power generation and other non-energy sectors, such as petrochemical, as the solutions are different. Today, I want to focus on industrial and commercial and residential sectors, which collectively account for around two-thirds of natural gas demand. Looking at industrial uses of gas, more than half um, half is for mining and oil and gas development, especially around the oil sands. I know the sector is looking to using less gas, and I'll leave that to other webinars and other research to discuss. A lot of important gas use is covered under the other category here. Much of that is the need for high temperature direct heat for industrial processes. Process industrial heat is hard to move to other fuels. We need, for a lot of industrial processes, high energy and combustion is required. Uh, as an example, if you're curing automotive paint, you need high temperature direct heat, and that requires combustion. Electricity just won't be allowed to do that. So the industrial processes is something that has to be considered as we think about the future of natural gas. There's not a lot of data on the commercial side, so I'm going to focus on the residential sector here, um, where there is more data. But many of the same issues are very common on both the residential side and the commercial side. And when we think about our own energy consumption, we tend to think of electricity, given that a lot of us, or all of us right now are using electricity. But 81% of residential energy use is actually for space and water heating. And given the high level, high use of natural gas for space and water heating in across Canada, particularly in Ontario and Alberta, what we see is that a whopping 84% of residential GHG emissions, these, these are emissions excluding transportation, come from space and water heating. We clearly need to look at heating when we're thinking about what we are to do with natural gas. Um, as I mentioned, many commercial buildings would have many of the same issues. And space and water heating are the primary energy demands for most commercial buildings as well. Now, when we look at swapping out, replacing natural gas with another energy source, it's it, it doesn't have to be a one for one complete swap. You don't have to replace one jewel with another jewel, as different technologies require a different amount of energy to produce services. For example, heat pumps can produce more heat with lower energy demand than gas combustion. But it does highlight that there is a significant energy need that we, that we, need, to, we need to deal with as we think about what we're going to do next with natural gas. So, what can we do? The status quo is clearly not an option. So, we need to look into and prepare for a net zero energy policy. Energy efficiency here will be key, of course. While a lot has been done on energy efficiency, there's always space for more. And it make, just makes sense that before making any large change, changes, the first step should be to reduce what you're using in order to make all the other changes easier. 
as a side note, if you look at any models on natural gas use in the future and what people are looking at replacing the energy energy services, most models assume around a 50% reduction in demand overall. But of course, we can't get there with efficiency alone. And while electrification will play a large role, we need to we'll likely need to also consider the role of low carbon gases, renew, such as renewable natural gas and hydrogen in the energy system. And why do we need to consider the gaseous stream? Well, one reason has to do with how cold Canada is in the winter and the peakiness of heating. This figures from Enbridge Gas, the gas distributor in Ontario, and it compares gas electricity demand in Ontario. And as we can see, this is from 2015, so it's a particularly cold year. As you can see, peak at peak, gas demand is three times that of peak electricity demand, and gas is also a lot peakier. Electricity is actually relatively flat when you look at it on an annual basis, on, on peak annual basis. Again, these numbers are not directly comparable, but it does illustrate that meeting peak heating needs in a cold country is difficult, and doing that with electricity alone would require a massive build out of both the grid and of generation. Electric heating and the use of heat pumps are often seen as a substitute. Well, they can't, they will play a role, and I think heat pumps are fantastic. They'll likely need backups in large areas of Canada. And the reason for that is winter in Canada is long, at least for those, at least for those of us out east. And there are, there are many minus 25 days in February that seemingly appear for weeks, maybe if they don't. And while smart heating and electrification with heat pumps can help meet those needs, the demand on the grid would be immense. This image is from US research published earlier this year that looked at the impact of electric space heating on the grid using heat pumps. Well, for much of the US, you can see particularly in the West, and obviously the South, the adding heating to adding heating to the electricity grid would not cause a ma major increase in the peak demand. Um, this is also where, however, in the Northeast, uh, the peak requirements would become much higher with electrification. And this is also where a lot of Canadians, including myself, live. And why is that? Well, air source heat pumps, even cold climber ones, generally struggle around minus 10. As temperatures get down to that level, other heating backups such as electric resistive heating heaters are needed. And many heat pumps include electric resistive elements in order to compensate for when temperatures get down that way. Electric resistive elements are just the standard old electric heat uh, heaters that you probably have, some people, you may have seen them in the rooms. Unfortunately for those of us, and for those of us out east, and yes, in February, I do sometimes wonder why I moved out here, it can be minus 10 for a long time, necessitating some form of backup to heat pumps or we require significant build out of grid capacity. And to give you an example of that, Quebec's peak demand in the winter is 36 gigawatts, and that is primarily due to heating demand. In Ontario, which has almost double the population of Quebec, uh, Ontario's peak electricity demand this year was around 24 gigawatts, and this is a particularly hot year and one of the highest peak demands on in, in decades. So as a result with electrification, if we're going to be relying on electric resistive heater to meet those really cold, really cold peak days, that would require huge investments in the electricity grid to meet that peak. And so we'd have this problem with, with if we had heat pumps, we'd have this strange situation where cumulatively energy use for heating would be down, but peak demand would actually be higher. And as I mentioned, peak demand when, is very important when you're looking at the grid. It is for this reason that all studies look in a cost of a hybrid future with electrification plus with some gaseous energy source as well, can decarbonize the energy system at a lower cost than just straight electrification. And it's not just me saying this, the IEA, this is from an IEA report from a couple of weeks ago. The IEA says that while electrification is key, other things will be required as well. And you can see electrification here is, is a significant component, but there are other renewables and other things to consider in there. So that's why we need to consider low carbon gases. So the, as I mentioned, the first step will naturally be efficiency to make it easier to replace the gas if you have to replace less of it. The most common form of low carbon gas is renewable natural gas, um, usually from wet waste, such as or agricultural waste, landfill and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, you can also gasify biomass, but that can be quite expensive. Scale and feedstocks are a problem. And most of the studies I've looked at show that RNG from wet waste, which is what we're generally seeing now, can probably only meet around five to 10% of, of current consumption. Um, I'm sure Sarah will talk more about that in her section as well. Another interesting option uh, gaining interest is hydrogen. There's a whole rainbow of hydrogen. There's green, there's green hydrogen for re is green for hydrogen produced from renewable electricity, blue for hydrogen produced from natural gas with carbon capture and storage, and even pink hydrogen, which is which is hydrogen produced from nuclear power. Uh, hydrogen could be blended with 
the current gas system or replace the gas system itself. But it's important to note that hydrogen is less energy dense than natural gas. So a 20% blend of hydrogen by volume in the gas system would actually only equate to about a 10% uh, blend on the energy content. Um, and so also we have to look at how, what are the problems of putting hydrogen through the network? There's some trials going on in, the, in Europe looking at a 20% blending of, of hydrogen in the, in the gas system. There's a proposal for a complete 100% blending of hydrogen in uh, Leeds. And Enbridge Gas, Fortis BC, and ADCO are also looking into pilot projects with small scale uh, hydrogen replacement. I'm sure Sabina will talk about this later. Uh, further option would be synthetic methane, where you use the hydrogen combining with carbon dioxide that you take from the air to create synthetic methane that can be put through the current energy um, infrastructure without any problem. And while policy will drive costs, drive development, costs are important. But when you're looking at costs, we have to consider cost to what? Cost of relative, cost of natural gas, current natural gas? Well, nothing can compete to current natural gas, it's too cheap. But cost of other renewable energy source? Well, maybe if you start comparing RNG and hydrogen to other renewable energy sources, the costs can be competitive. Uh, this is data taken from uh, current cost of different technologies in Canadian dollars per gigajoule. Uh, this is Lazar data for the renewable energy. And costs are coming down. And of course, with renewable energy declines, you'll also have cheap, potentially have cheaper hydrogen costs and the costs can even go down low. So as you can see, it's not directly comparable. In many cases, RNG and hydrogen can be competitive with some renewable technologies. So what does that mean? We need to consider costs and impacts on consumers. Can continuing to use some gaseous energy source will allow us to continue to use the infrastructure that we have? And a lot has been invested in that infrastructure and that can help keep costs down. And there are a lot of benefits to a gaseous energy system, namely the ability to store it, the ability to use it flexibly when needed, and that combustion, as I mentioned, is still required for many industrial processes. One option would be a hybrid system where you, where electrification is the primary energy source with the backup provided through the gas system using clean gas. Of course, the cost for this and what would happen, what would be the impact on a gas distributor when you have low demand would have to be considered. But you also have to look at timelines. If you want to replace the gas system with others, how long would it take to build other generation and transmission in order to completely replace the gas system? Building new electricity transmission distribution takes a long time. So what, what can we do now? And in the end, the question we do really need to be considering is not, can the gas system play a role? The gas system can play a role. The technology exists. The modeling shows that it would benefit everybody. But the real question we should be asking is, will the gas system play the role? In other words, can the gas sector and the gas distributors pivot to a low carbon future fast enough that they're not left behind? And that's a question I cannot answer, unfortunately. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present. We look forward to the questions. Thanks, Richard. Um, thanks for that high level overview. We'll take some questions at the end of all the presentations, but right now I'd like to move on to Sabina Russell who'll speak to more uh, of the role of hydrogen and the potential to decarbonize. Thank you. Go ahead, Sabina. Great, thank you. Hopefully my screen is showing. We'll assume it is. <laughs> um, okay, so just a quick introduction about uh, who is this little company Zen Clean Energy. Um, so we're an eight-person firm out of Vancouver, BC in our fifth year of business. Um, pretty much everything we do is focused on hydrogen and fuel cells or some part of the ecosystem around it. Um, and the one thing I want to say is, you know, I'm going to be talking today about some of the results of different studies we've done or different analysis we've done. And that's a big part of our business for sure. Um, as, as Tara had mentioned at the beginning, we're currently working with the Government of Canada on the hydrogen strategy for Canada. We published the British Columbia hydrogen strategy last year, um, and we're also working on a maritime study. So we do that type of analysis work, but our, our analysis is, is, and strategy is really grounded in practical hands-on experience, because ultimately we're very passionate about getting the technology out in the world, making a difference in decarbonization and air quality. So you know, we, we're, we work with clients to develop projects, get funding and manage them, and we do a lot of work in California where strong regulatory measures are really driving a transition to uh, zero emission transportation. So that's just a little bit about who we are. 
I'm going to start with some basics on hydrogen today, just very high level, and then talk about why, you know, why we need it in Canada. And I think Richard did a great job introducing that. Um, and then most of the focus is going to be on production pathways um, and, and how it can be used and how that impacts the overall decarbonization potential. And then I'll end off with, you know, how do we move forward from here from a very high level? So just in terms of, you know, what is hydrogen? I think we have a range probably of people on this webinar with different levels of knowledge, but um, hydrogen is the simplest element in the, on Earth. It makes up 75% of the entire universe, but it doesn't usually exist in its for free state or pure state. So it's usually bound to other, um, other in, in a molecular form, like in water or biomass or hydrocarbon fuels. Um, in terms of energy density, uh, Richard pointed out that it is low on a vol volumetric perspective. And often when we talk about hydrogen and natural gas, we're really talking about percentage by volume. And it's about a third the volumetric energy density. But for some applications, what's more important is gravimetric energy density. So how much energy do you get per unit of mass? And hydrogen is actually the highest fuel that, that's out there. So that's very beneficial for some of these high duty cycle type applications. Um, from a safety point of view, you know, we've been studying hydrogen for many, many years and looking at how it disperses, if there's a leak in a vehicle, for example, how we detect it. Um, and so there's really good knowledge in that side of things. Um, hydrogen really is an energy carrier. So it's really, you should think of it like electricity where it's more storing um, electricity rather than the energy source itself. Um, and so just in terms of benefits, one of the things that's great about hydrogen is it's a very flexible energy um, carrier, very versatile. It can be used in a, a lot of different ways. Um, if you run it through a fuel cell and have electrochemical conversion, it's very high efficiency, usually about twice that of a combustion engine. Um, it only emits water and heat, um, so zero emission. But you can also burn it, and it's a great source of, of heat um, without releasing carbon at the point of use. Um, and then it's used as a feedstock in a number of different industrial processes. So upgrading um, oil, and, oil and gas products to refined petroleum products. It's used to make fertilizer. Um, it can be used to make heat in the cement industry. So it's used in, in a variety of different forms. As I mentioned, it's carbon free at the point of use. Um, obviously, as we look at, at a net zero future by 2050 in Canada, this distributed combustion and releasing carbon into the air at the point of use is so challenging to pull it back out. And so hydrogen really offers that benefit. Um, I'm gonna talk more about pathways, but it can be made from a lot of different uh, feedstocks. So it, it is a, it adds to resilience of our energy system because of that. Um, and one thing that's quite different from hydrogen and electricity is hydrogen can be transported across big distances and it can be stored indefinitely. So you can make it wherever you need to, where, wherever your feedstock sources are, and you can ship it and you don't have to try to match you know, timing of production and end use. Um, and as I mentioned, because of the high energy density, it's very well suited to heavy duty cycles. So, you know, I think everybody probably realizes that the story today around why, why does everybody suddenly care so much about hydrogen? Um, I've been in the sector for a long time and it's great to see this momentum, but I think it's really because governments around the world are, are starting to really think about, well, how do we achieve net zero? You know, this pathway of just taking little steps forward is not going to get us there. We need a very significant transformation of our energy system. And I think everybody's recognizing that there's a gap. If you just look at electrification, which we should push as far as we can, and biofuels, and there's now new technologies around things like, you know, negative emissions, like direct air capture, there's still a gap. And that gap is somewhere in that 20 to 30 percent range. And hydrogen is very well suited to, to closing that gap. Um, so a lot of momentum right now in hydrogen around the world. Um, but you know, what really started it, it's interesting, is air quality. And it's something we shouldn't forget about either. It's a major benefit of, of using hydrogen. And when you look back at California and how they led the charge on, on hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles, it was really around improving air quality and health outcomes for their citizens. And that's a major benefit that hydrogen brings, especially in transportation when you know, displacing diesel in, in urban centers. So Canada is really well positioned. Um, it's going to be very exciting when the hydrogen strategy for Canada comes out and, and really highlights some of these points. But you know, we, we do have 
rich feedstocks. We're an energy rich country. We're very fortunate that way. We have low carbon intensity electricity. We have abundant fossil fuel reserves. We have fresh water. We have biomass. All those things can be harnessed to make clean hydrogen. Um, we have a very strong industry position here. We've got, you know, clusters of companies that are world leading um, that are really driving the move to fuel cells and hydrogen production technologies and adjacent ones like carbon capture and storage that are really important. We also have a very strong energy sector. We have about 900,000 direct and indirect jobs in our energy sector. We have close to 600 billion in assets. Those things can position us to pivot well into a hydrogen future. Um, and we have a head start. We make more than 3 million um, tons of hydrogen per year today, mostly for upgrading, and it's mostly not considered low carbon intensity, but we know we know how to make hydrogen, we know how to handle it, and it positions us well. Um, you know, international collaborations also are critical. We can't do this alone. Um, and ultimately, it's not about just deploying hydrogen here in Canada, but there's potential for export as well. So I've already talked about benefits around decarbonization and clean air. Um, I think, you know, pragmatically, we also have to look at our economy and the challenges our oil and gas sector face. I believe hydrogen can really offer an opportunity for them to transform in a way that matches our net zero future. Um, hydrogen also integrates, it's going to start blurring the line between natural gas and electricity utilities because it really is this resilient energy carrier that, that can blend between different um, infrastructure assets that we have. And ultimately, you know, by embracing the potential hydrogen has, we can see significant economic growth, both from domestic deployments and the export opportunity that hydrogen brings. So this is a bit of a, a complicated graph. I won't go into it too, or schematic, I won't go into too much detail, but this kind of highlights that hydrogen can be made in a bunch of different ways. So you can make it from clean electricity and water through the electrolysis process. Uh, you can make hydrogen from fossil fuel sources. Um, I think we all believe that we all are in, in alignment that we need to abate any carbon that's produced in that process through carbon capture and sequestration, or you know, by some processes produce it as a solid carbon. But you can make it from natural gas, you can make it from crude oil, you can't even make it by through coal, like Australia is really focused on that. Biomass is another um, energy vector we can use to produce hydrogen. And there's actually quite a lot of vented hydrogen in Canada today because it's a byproduct of sodium chlorate and chlorate and chloralkali production. Although it's limited in capacity, there's actually a fair amount we could capture today pretty economically. Um, and then how can it be used? So it can be used directly as a transportation fuel. I think ultimately everybody agrees that the that better efficiency and zero emissions of fuel cell vehicles are the ultimate pathway. In the interim, there's some potential for co-combustion with diesel and, and hydrogen um, combined. Um, hydrogen can be used to actually produce power either through a stationary fuel cell system or through a, a turbine, um, and it can be burned to produce heat for building for industry and, and also used as a feedstock for industry. So a little bit more on pathways. Um, this just shows that sort of view of clean electricity, fossil fuels, and biomass as the major feedstocks. And of course, I mentioned you can also capture waste hydrogen. But when we look at the future and how much hydrogen um, could be needed to close the gap in a 2050 energy scenario, it's very, very significant. Um, you know, if you look at 20 to 30 percent of our delivered energy, we're talking you know, up to 3,000 petajoules of energy. It's a lot. And at the same time, we need to be electrifying directly everything that we can. We need to be increasing biofuel production. So this is my personal view, and I know not everybody will agree with it, but I ultimately believe there's an urgency to decarbonize for the future of our kids. We all know why we need to do it, and we need to do it immediately. And so we have to look at economics, and we have to look at capacities at that macro scale. Ultimately, we also need sustainable energy. And so, you know, we, we do need to increasingly be looking at renewable sources for the hydrogen production that are more economically challenged today, though. And so we need to balance the two. Um, I think that immediately we need to be setting thresholds on carbon intensity. Um, the graphs on the right here show from the BC study that we did, um, you know, the costs. And you can see fossil fuel based feedstocks. SMR baseline is sort of what we can produce for today without carbon capture. That's not the direction we need to take. But you can see that fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage is still lower cost than most um, 
electrolysis based production. That will change over time. I think we'll start to see more a closing of the gap, but that's kind of where we are today. And when you look at the bottom graph, that shows carbon intensity of the different pathways. So SMR, obviously it's, it's high. The dashed green line shows an example of a threshold being considered in Europe, um, where they, they look at, we have to have at least a 60% reduction from gray hydrogen production. Um, and I think it's important to see that fossil fuel base can be both low cost and low carbon intensity. But you know, ultimately renewable green hydrogen that's more expensive today can be zero carbon intensity. So any pathway that has some carbon emitted will need some sort of abat abatement. And ultimately, you know, we need to work towards the, the right hand end of the scale, which is production from renewables. Um, I wanted to show another graph of um, carbon intensity that's just broader than the BC context because BC is really fortunate and so our grid connected production looked really quite low because we have so much hydro in BC. But I just wanted to point out that actually parts of our country do not have a clean grid. They have high carbon intensity, they're looking to decarbonize, but if we made hydrogen from electrolysis, for example, in Alberta today or in Nova Scotia today, the carbon emissions are in some cases higher than making it just through SMR production, even without carbon capture and abatement. So we have to be so mindful of the pathways we develop regionally in Canada as we go forward. So a little bit about economics, and I'm going to focus on hydrogen as a heating fuel. And I, I just want to say that this graph looks quite different. On the, on the left, this is the cost um, in a dollar per gigajoule kind of normalized basis of hydrogen compared to other options for heating fuel. So fuel oil, obviously high emitting, um, but still used in, in parts like PEI, for example. And we've got natural gas, which is probably the most common heating fuel. You could have natural gas with direct air capture in the future to offset emissions um, and you know, renewable natural gas, resistive heating, where it's just without a, a heat pump, and then on the right, um, with a heat pump. And in this case, we've normalized it to include the coefficient of performance benefit with a heat pump. And that is suitable absolutely for some applications and not for others. Um, so you can see hydrogen, when you produce it in bulk and you know, put it into the pipeline, these are costs that are achievable today at scale. It, it can be very competitive. Um, and I think the point is that we're gonna need probably multiple of these pathways that are on the cleaner end um, and hydrogen can play its role competitively economically. Um, and then of course you need to look at you know, GHG abatement because really that's why we're going through this transition. And so the, the bottom graph here shows um, how hydrogen compares in terms of um, GHG reduction where a positive number means it's actually positively reducing, it's reducing emissions and a negative number could mean it's actually adding to our emissions. So again, if we um, electri electrically heat in regions with a very dirty grid, we can actually be worse than our baseline in this case being natural gas for emissions. So where, you know, where are we today? Um, I just wanted to highlight projects with a SAR where you know, we're really looking at hydrogen as a vector to decarbonize our natural gas grid. And I think that it's really exciting. We're seeing utilities coming to the table, Canadian Gas Association is playing a really important role. Um, and it, you know, we, we've got a project, I think the first project was actually in Ontario with Enbridge at the Markham facility where they make hydrogen through electrolysis. Um, they use it for grid regulation services, but also um, you know, with the intention to inject it into the natural gas grid to decarbonize. Um, ATCO has a couple projects um, under development in Alberta, including a blending project in Fort Saskatchewan that they've recently announced. Um, and then really important is when we look at scale, carbon capture and utilization and storage projects, those go hand in hand when we look at production from fossil fuels. So there's lots going on in that um, side of things as well. And then coast to coast, you know, we've got big utilities like Fortis BC. Um, they, they did co-fund the BC hydrogen study. I should make that clear as well. But they're really aggressively looking at how they meet the clean BC targets and hydrogen seems to be a really important part of that piece. Heritage Gas um, on the other part of Canada and the Maritimes is also looking strategically at long term and what role they can play in being carbon neutral by 2050. So this is my last slide here just in terms of you know what are the opportunities, what are the challenges and, and how can we kind of break through some of those challenges and move forward. 
Um, you know, I, I truly believe that hydrogen will play a critical role in the natural gas industry if, if the natural gas industry wants to be a big player in a carbon neutral scenario. Um, and, and I think they need to play an important role. They manage our infrastructure assets and we don't want to scram those assets. We will need them to deliver the energy that we need. Um, and there, the two ways hydrogen can help is through blending. Um, I think you know it's very accepted that five to 20% is technically viable. Even in the near term, there's parts, regions around the world developing that already. And when you start to get above that, you have to start to really look at, okay, do we go into dedicated hydrogen pipelines? Again, very viable, we have them in Alberta already. Or do we try to look at increasing blending limits? I think we'll, we'll probably look at both regionally. Um, and then when you really look at 2050 and you say, if we're truly going to meet net zero, we should not be having much in the way of distributed um, combustion emissions. And so really we could be looking at high, you know, natural gas grids that are no longer called that, but they're more chemical fuel grids. And, and some of them could be 100% hydrogen. We could be looking at 50% of the energy in those grids is delivered by hydrogen. So challenges, you know, Canada is behind other regions, although I think that there's an effort to quickly hurry and catch up and potentially leapfrog. But safety and reliability, especially in blending, is something we need to work on. We need to work on the codes and standards um, that back that up. Um, economics, of course, are a challenge, especially because we don't truly recognize the cost of carbon. I think the federal clean fuel standard that's, you know, under development will help in that way. And I think we'll start to see a reconciliation of costs. Um, and then just in end use appliances, there's there's much work to do as well. I think up to 15 to 20%, it's almost an invisible change to most end use appliances, but big boilers, things like that need, need more technical work. So how do we get there? I think pilots are really critical in the near term. Um, I think, you know, the first step is to look at these blending pilots. Um, I think there's quite a few under development and they're big, big projects at scale and that's what we need and we need to support those. Um, we need really all the utilities and regions and authorities having jurisdiction um, and even international partners to come together and look at how do we move quickly from early pilots blending up to 5% to that 20% level. Um, we do realize too that across the board with hydrogen, not just in heating, but awareness is a big issue still. And, you know, I think it's great to see the leadership of municipalities, for example, that are looking, you know, how do we have a carbon-free city at this period in time? But so many of them jump right away to what they know, which is, okay, we're gonna do electric heating. And, and, and that's maybe not always the best option, especially when you look at, we're gonna have more battery electric vehicles, we're gonna have other things demanding that electricity, you know, heating with hydrogen um, is going to be really important. And so we need to spread that awareness in the general public, across governments, and with industry as well. Thanks, um, Sabina. Sorry, we're okay. coming up on time. Okay, I just have two more points, which is, you know, beyond blending and these pilots, you know, we're going to see these mini grids that are hydrogen dedicated, and we need to start working on those now. And then there's always the fundal, fundamental R&D piece. Um, we have technologies today that can get us going, but long term, we need to really be working on things that reduce cost and get us up to these higher limits. So thank you very much. And that was my last slide. I will stop sharing here. Thanks, Savina. That was uh, that was great. A lot of great points there that I'm hoping that we can we can uh, touch on with uh, the discussion. And now um, I'd like to introduce uh, again, Sarah, who will be giving us a bit of uh, information on RNG. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Tara. So you can see my screen all right? Yes. Perfect, okay. So thank you for the introduction earlier. And today I'm gonna to give an overview on renewable natural gas and its role in Canada's energy systems. So first I just wanna to touch on, give a brief introduction to the Canadian Biogas Association or the CBA. So we are a not-for-profit member-based industry association that's focused on building the biogas and RNG industry in Canada to its biggest potential. And you can learn more about us at our website, biogasassociation.ca. So just to hop right into it and really give a introductory overview on what renewable natural gas is. So renewable natural gas and biogas are formed through a process called anaerobic digestion, which is often shortened to AD. And that is the biological process of breaking down organic matter in the absence of oxygen to create biogas. 
Biogas is a renewable form of methane, and its composition is roughly made up of 60% methane and 40% carbon dioxide. Biogas can be used to generate electricity or in boilers to generate heat, or it can be refined or upgraded to renewable natural gas, RNG. When the biogas is upgraded, that carbon dioxide portion is removed and you're left with a very high methane content gas, which is interchangeable with natural gas in most applications. Another important byproduct of the anaerobic digestion process is digestate. So you have the gas in the form of biogas and RNG, and you're also left with this solid liquid slurry that's really nutrient rich and used as a fertilizer in crops to grow our food. There are a lot of different organic sources or feedstocks for biogas and RNG. So we've got agriculture, landfill, your green bin, residential source separated organics, commercial organics, and also wastewater treatment plants that use anaerobic digestion to treat biosolids. As I mentioned before, RNG is interchangeable with natural gas in most applications. So in a lot of sites across Canada, RNG is being injected directly into natural gas grids. And it's really great because it can leverage existing infrastructure to transport the low carbon fuel. Another application for RNG is transportation fuel. So vehicles that already have natural gas engines can just swap out and use renewable natural gas instead. And it can also be used for on-site energy. In terms of environmental benefits, RNG and biogas reduce greenhouse gas emissions in two main ways. So the first is it captures methane, which would have otherwise been released into the atmosphere. And this is really important because methane is a potent short-lived greenhouse gas that's 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide over a 20-year period. The second way it directly reduces greenhouse gas is through displacing the use of fossil fuels for energy applications, such as electricity or heating. Another environmental benefit comes from the digestate. So it replaces commercial fertilizer, and that means that product does not need to be manufactured. And it returns organic matter and carbon to the soil, which is so important for regenerating the soil and providing nutrients for crops. On to the landscape of renewable natural gas in Canada. So including biogas and renewable natural gas facilities, we have over 200 operating facilities across Canada. This includes agricultural and food waste digesters, wastewater tr treatment facilities, and landfill gas projects. This really just shows the diversity of the technology, and many of these are different scale as well. So it's, it's quite a diverse technology. This graph we have available on our website, this map we have available on our website, and it shows the different projects and different types of projects across the country. You're welcome to visit on our website. I have the link below on this presentation if you want to look at this in some more detail. And we have our, our legend there as well. The photos that we have up are from renewable natural gas projects across Canada, so in British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec. Looking at how the RNG industry has developed over the last 10 years, you'll see that there has been pretty steady growth in the number of projects developed year over year. So in 2010, we started with just two operational projects. And now in 2020, we are at 11 operational projects in three provinces. And currently there are 21 more projects in development. So this breaks this down a little bit further so you can see where the development is happening. Currently those 11 operating projects are generating over 5 million gigajoules of RNG annually and that's all being injected into renewable into the natural gas grid. And then in development we have 21 in development as I mentioned and that will account for 3 million gigajoules of RNG production. The photos that I have here on the top, we have the Hamilton Woodward Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant in Ontario, and that's their RNG upgrading system. And the photo at the bottom is Fraser Valley Biogas, which is an RNG facility in Abbotsford, British Columbia. This slide provides a little bit more of an explanation as to why we're seeing RNG development in those key provinces that we've that we've seen in the past slides. So British Columbia 
introduced an RNG program in 2007 where RNG producers can inject RNG into the grid and be paid for that gas. So they can be paid up to $30 per gigajoule. In Quebec, a similar program was put in place in 2017, and they pay seven to twenty-two dollars per gigajoule depending on the type of project. And there are currently four operational, and you'll notice there's 11 in development, which is quite a large number. Quebec has quite a few um, good funding sources for renewable natural gas, and eight of those 11 projects have received funding for development to create RNG for grid injection. In Ontario, Enbridge has put forth a proposed voluntary RNG program to the Ontario Energy Board, and we are currently awaiting a final decision on that from the OEB. Moving on to challenges and opportunities in the sector. So there are quite a few challenges that are limiting future development. So one is approvals and connections. The approvals process can be quite complex. And for project developers, it can take a significant amount of expertise and time to navigate that process. Another issue is public consultation and public opposition to projects. So it's really important to properly engage and educate other stakeholders when it comes to developing a project. Market competition can be a barrier if there are other jurisdictions that are offering a better price for renewable natural gas. So this can be a barrier if you're looking to develop projects in a specific region. Limits on feedstock can be a barrier when there are cheaper disposal options available, for example, in landfills. And then cost is a huge barrier. Um, the last time I checked, natural gas is between two to five dollars per gigajoule, where renewable natural gas can go for up to thirty dollars per gigajoule. So that's quite a big price gap and also the high capital investments in technologies. So it's really important to have you know, a stable financial outlook for a project before you start developing. So to unlock the value of RNG and overcome these barrier, barriers, the CBA has identified three elements needed to advance the market. So one is a tangible target or goal. This would be in the form of a renewable content requirement. The CBA and other industry associations have set aspirational targets of 5% RNG in the pipeline by 2025 and 10% by 2030. British Columbia's Clean BC plan has a 15% renewable gas goal by 2030, and Quebec has a 5% renewable natural gas goal by 2025. A strong market pull in the form of reasonable and stable government policy and programs will also be key to support, to support sustainable long-term product demand. And an example of this could be organics diversion policies that redirect organics to really beneficial uses that recover that energy and nutrient value from the organics. And the third element is clear market mechanisms that value and monetize the environmental attributes of biogas, renewable, renewable natural gas, and other low carbon technologies. So a well-defined approach uh, will send a strong signal and enable broad participation by the industry. Just for my last two slides, I quickly wanna to touch on a couple educational resources that we have available for those who would like to learn more about biogas and RNG. Over the years, the CVA has developed extensive resources in the forms of primers, guides, fact sheets, um, really that cover almost every aspect of the industry. And that's all available on our website, uh, biogasassociation.ca. Those can be fairly technical, though. So we also have a bettergas.ca microsite, which we launched in spring 2020 which really communicates the sustainability of biogas and RNG and is a great introduction for yourself or for your colleagues or anybody you know who may, may want to learn more about the industry. It's a really, really great resource to check out. So with that, thank you for listening and I'll hand it back over to Tara. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, having problems with my <laughs> mute button there. Uh, thank you for that presentation. We're just going to do a brief poll right now. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, for their presentations. There was a lot of great information there. We're just going to do a quick poll um, in just a minute or so. 
just to gauge where everyone is so far. Um, the question is, what are the most important first steps to increasing hydrogen and RNG in, in the energy mix? Uh, and I'll let you select one or more of the following, uh, clear standards and regulations, government subsidies, private sector leadership and investment, public awareness and support, and our, our d and on technical challenges. And so we'll just give you a minute uh, to complete that and then move on to questions. Okay, I think we're coming up on a minute there. And so the majority of, of respondents had said that uh, clear standards and regulations are really the place that we need um, more, and first, more, more, more first steps. And I think that's critical to understanding, um, setting the, the landscape to allow um, production to happen. And second, uh, we have government subsidies and RD and D on technical challenges uh, almost in dead heat for second. Um, and also uh, private leadership and investment is also an area that looks like uh, we need some further development. So thank you for participating in that poll. Um, and right now, we have a few minutes for questions remaining. And I guess I'll start us off by, by asking one. Um, thank you so much for, for providing all of that information in, 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 the, in your presentations. And I think that some of this might be have been covered, but I think it's a great way to sum up things. And I'll, I'll ask each and every one of you to uh, respond uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll move to, to participant questions. So do you think that we're on the right track for, for developing enough low carbon or renewable hydrogen and, and RNG to really make up enough ground to, to meet our emission targets for 2030 and 2050? Um, and if we, you know, what steps do we need to take or what needs to be done to ensure that we meet those emission target deadlines. Richard, I'll start with you. Thanks, I appreciate that. Uh, no, I don't think we are moving fast enough to meet our deadlines. And I would agree with the poll question that came in that clear standards of regulations are is are going to be uh, important. I couldn't vote because apparently panelists can't vote, which I thought was kind of rude, but I would have voted for that one if I could. And I think it's I think we really need to think about setting in starting to set in, like as bc and quebec have done some some small programs in order to kind of get things moving in order to start the development to start the industry off in order to start and also to sometimes not all utilities but some utilities need to be kind of broad kicking and screaming into the uh into the chain into the changes coming up some are quite good but others need to be broad kicking and screaming sabina yeah, unfortunately, I kind of agree that I would say right now we're not doing enough. We're not, we haven't really embraced the change that we need to make. We've said we're going to be net zero, but we don't really have these holistic plans that look at all the energy vectors and figure out how do we push each one because each one needs to move hand in hand. Um, and but I guess I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that there's some change in the air. You know, I I've seen, I focus on hydrogen, but I've seen just an, a really strong increase in interest and, and big players, you know, like energy companies are starting to understand how maintaining a social license to operate, being part of a net zero future, they have to start being part of this discussion and, and we need them to be part of it, you know, and, and I think they're, they're coming along. Um, so, but I, I agree again that it's the regulatory piece and the standards piece that are going to ultimately, that's where we see the action happening, you know, in regions where they've set clear targets, clear thresholds, um, that's where things start to really move. And we just need that more broadly across Canada. And do you think, uh, just to follow up, do you think that the roadmaps that are coming out on the hydrogen side uh, will help accelerate that uh, or will help identify some of those issues a bit more or? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that they will, and I think there's going to be a regional aspect that needs to follow. Like federal roadmap sets the here's why it's important and here's the magnitude of change we need, but then it's got to happen regionally as well. And I, I think that it'll set that vision that will hopefully drive action to follow. And Sarah, on the RNG front, do you think we all have enough? 
Right. So, I, I mean, I do also want to agree with what Richard and Sabina have said, and there was also the poll as well. Um, and we have seen with other jurisdictions where there are programs in place, we do see that growth in the industry. And also as an association, the interest that we're seeing from utilities and other stakeholders is really encouraging for the interest and the potential out there to develop RNG pro, RNG projects. Um, it's really just getting that that good foundation in place to really let the industry take off. Great, thank you for that. So I think we have a few moments left for a couple of questions from, from our audience. Um, Sabina, this question is for you and it's it's a, probably one that you've heard uh, in some of your dealings with, with the hydrogen roadmap. Um, there's concern about using natural gas as a feedstock for for hydrogen and and how clean it is given that there's upstream and uh, fugitive emissions and hand in hand with that is you know what are the challenges with CCUS and um, in terms of cost and and timing before it becomes uh, more commonplace or uh, commercially viable that's mm -hmm. a question for the audience yeah, and it's a, it's a good and a fair question. I mean, when we model the carbon intensity of the pathways, we, we look at all of that, like upstream, fugitive, right down to the final production of hydrogen. And, and it shows really good potential to be low carbon intensity. Um, there's a lot of work to do on carbon capture and, and storage, um, but Canada actually has great leadership capability in that area and and is moving forward you know with the alberta trunk line for example so it's already happening in pockets and um, we also have great sort of geological storage potential for the co2 um so i think it's i it's just when you look at the magnitude of the, the energy that we need and and what what electricity is going to have to do i don't see a way to do it without using some fossil fuels for the next several decades and so we have to do it in a responsible way in capturing that carbon. And we need to put effort into making sure we, you know, we monitor it and, and track it and, and are confident it's resulting in the abatement we think it, it is. There's also some really promising pathways where you don't have gaseous CO2, but you have solid carbon byproducts. So pyrolysis um, and that, that solid carbon is much easier to store and, and be sure it won't be released in the atmosphere. And it can actually be used as a valuable feedstock for, for high value products as well. So I think natural gas, it's not just one pathway, but um, you know, I'm confident that it will play a part of Canada's hydrogen story, but there's, there's work to be done. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we're just coming up with a couple minutes left. Um, there's one question um, really for Sarah uh, that I think we can squeeze in, uh, you know, how close are we to having RNG play a significant role in Canada's energy system in terms of real production uh, versus purchasing credits? And what's your view on credits? That's a tough so one. In, yeah, I know, I know. That, that there's many different ways to approach that. Um, so in terms of credits, um, are, is that referring to the clean fuel standard or RINs? I think there, it, it, it's not specific, but I would say in Canada, maybe the LCFS um, mm -hmm. sort of example. Uh, you know, where when when do we see significant um, production in RNG um, beyond you know to to help reach that that thirty percent gap that we're talking about? Um, in in, in mm -hmm. right now, we're looking at about you know ten gigajoules annually of of RNG. Do you, when do you see that level uh, increasing significantly? Yeah, so we, currently we have 5 million gigajoules annually of RNG being produced. Um, and I think at, at Sabina in her presentation was talking about how there are many different solutions to the decarbonization. So RNG is really just a piece of the puzzle. Uh, in areas with, like British Columbia and Quebec where we have those programs, we're seeing a lot of projects that are ready to go. So there's a lot more projects ready to go than are, are in operation right now. Um, so there's definitely a lot of potential there. A recent study was put out by Torchlight Bioresources and a very conservative estimate was that there's potential in Canada for at least 700 more projects of 100,000 gigajoules each. So there's quite, uh, there's quite an untapped resource right now. And then in terms of credits, monetizing those environmental attributes, as I said in my presentation, are really key. So um, I'm not sure if 
that question was meant to be <laughs> meant to be controversial at all, but we definitely need to um, monetize those environmental attributes. Uh, the CFS can play a good role in that, and as well as uh, the LCFS. Okay, thank you. We're actually coming up on time, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, we, we have so many good questions, which just highlights the interest in the topic of this webinar today, and I want to thank the panelists and uh, the audience who, who has uh, signed in today. Um, we're going to conclude the webinar for today, um, but we will be, be having a part two to this series next week. Um, with the role of utilities in accelerating hydrogen and RNG adoption. So please sign up for those if you haven't already. And thank you again to our panelists and for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.